those of you who have been with us throughout this series, you know then the next direction that we're heading and you know where we're going. But for those of you who may be with us for the first time, let me give you a little bit of a lay of the land in terms of what we've been doing with this sermon series. So we broke it up really down into three parts. It's six weeks, two weeks each, right, where we are focusing on our identity by looking up and then looking in and then looking out, right? We have to start this conversation about our identity in Christ by looking up to understand who God is and what he has done for us. That is, first and foremost, the place where our identity is rooted. I think Paul says about 167 times or something like that in the New Testament that our identity is found in Christ. So we start by looking up, and then the last couple of weeks, we looked in to see how this identity impacts ourselves. And so we learn what it means to overcome this orphan mentality that we have. To understand that God is truly our father, that he has adopted us as sons and as daughters. And then we learn what it meant to overcome temptation as we pursue this transformation that we have in Jesus. Man, the testimonies have been unbelievable. Unbelievable. We have seen so many strongholds broken, seeing transformation happening here, even with people that have been attending Awaken since the very first Sunday that we held a service. God has been doing some truly unbelievable things. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't watched those messages from the last couple of weeks, man, go back and watch those. You will be so happy that you did. But this morning, I get the pleasure of turning us uh, towards that last part of the series, that third and final part where we get to look out now, where we get to look out and to recognize this identity that we have received, how it's not just given to us. Right? Our identities have been given to us so that we might impact the world around us. And unless and until we realize that, friends, we are not living into our full identity. All right, so we can receive what God has done for us. We can understand how that impacts us personally. But until we actually live that out, we're not living into our full identity. So we start by looking up. But we got to look in and then look out. I love how Paul in Ephesians 2.10, he actually lays this out for us very, very simply. He says, we are his workmanship. Created what? Anybody know? Thank you. I know more of you know that. It's okay. We're going to do a little bit of call and response here too, okay? So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the works he has prepared beforehand for us in order that we might walk in them. So here's what that means, family. It means that your salvation is not the finish line of your faith journey. We talk about this all the time. Your salvation is just the starting point. It's just the starting point because your salvation should lead to transformation, which then should lead to proclamation. Y'all follow me? Salvation, transformation, proclamation. That's the path that God laid out for you before you even started to follow him. If it sounds familiar to you, it's because it follows that same path, right? It's up and then in and then out. The good news of the gospel, the truth of who God is, what he has done for your life, it transforms your heart. It transforms your life. But then you are supposed to live that out so that God can use it to transform others. That's the more that we have all been made for, to be a reflection of Jesus to the world around us so that when people see you, they see Jesus, right? When they listen to you, they hear Jesus, right? And then when they want to know what's different about you, what do you tell them? You tell them about the love of Jesus. See, family, your identity is found in Christ, but that's not just a truth for you to receive. It's one that you're called to help others believe. That's why our vision here at Awaken is to help people to wake up to engage and to go out. Wake up, engage, go out. It's on the sign right back there, but it's more than just a fancy slogan. We have a deep desire here to see people wake up to the mission that God has put on their lives, to see them engage in a community centered around Jesus. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there because we're called to go out, to live into our identity as ambassadors for Christ so that the world will know the hope of Jesus. So it's wake up, engage, and go out. Y'all, I am fired up to bring this message this morning, and not just because I had a couple of weeks off, because I want us to understand the responsibility that we have as a church, as a family, to go out, to be a reflection of Jesus to the world around us. We always say here that church happens more between Sundays than on Sundays, which means church happens more out there than it does in here. And that means that you don't need a pulpit. You've been given a purpose, right, to be an ambassador for Christ. So let me ask you, church, does your life reflect the love of Jesus? 
It's a simple question, right? When people see you, do they see Jesus? When they listen to you speak, do they hear Jesus? And when they engage with you, do they experience the love of Jesus? Because the reality is, especially in a city like Austin, your life may be the only Bible a person ever reads. Let that sit with you for a second. Your life may be the only Bible a person ever reads. And if that's true, does your life tell the story of the transformative love of Jesus? I want you just to sit with that question. I want that to be in the back of your mind as we go throughout this message. Does your life tell the story of the transformative love of Jesus? I'm excited to dive in the word together today, but before we do, would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, grateful for who you are and who you've declared us to be. Lord, what incredible grace and mercy that you would not just call us your sons and your daughters, but that you would appoint us to be your representatives to the world, Lord. And I pray that you would use this time to speak through your word, to wake us up, wake us up to this mission that you've given us, your ambassadors and Holy Spirit, would you give us the wisdom, the discernment, and the courage that we need to live out this identity that we have received in order that the world might know the hope of Jesus. It's in his holy name that we pray. And all God's children said, amen. amen, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be over these next couple of weeks in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. And so I'd encourage you in your own personal devotional time this week, spend some time meditating, praying over those verses. I think as you do, you'll come to realize that Paul writes these words from a very vulnerable, very personal, very raw place. He goes deep and gets real, kind of embodying one of our core values here by sharing this responsibility that each one of us has as representatives of Christ. And there's a reason why it feels so raw. You see, Paul has experienced all of these things that he's going to talk about. He knows exactly the cost of following Jesus. I mean, he's been shipwrecked, jailed, beaten, stoned. He's experienced all of those things, but none of those things could keep him from sharing the love of Jesus. And here's why, family, because the love of Christ changes everything, period. The love of Christ changes everything, not just the way you see yourself, but the way you see the world around you and the way you see your purpose in it. And it's not that you've been given this pair of like rose-colored glasses where all of a sudden everything looks great where your bank account's looking good, your kids are well-behaved. No, you haven't been given rose-colored glasses. You've been given gospel lenses through which to see the world. You've been given gospel lenses so that you can clearly see that your purpose in the world is to collide with those who are broken and hurting so that they might know the hope and love of Jesus. The love of Christ changes everything. And as we're going to see here as we dive into the Word, it doesn't just change the way that you see the world. It changes the way the world sees you. So look with me, if you would, at 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 13. It says, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Now, what Paul is actually doing here at the start of this passage is he's actually responding to some of this criticism that was leveled against him. There's a little bit of a backstory we don't have time to get into, but Paul is writing to the church in Corinth because there are more than a few people there that thought that Paul was sort of off his rocker, right? That he had lost his marbles or whatever saying you want to say about it. They thought Paul was out of his mind because of some of the things that he was saying and doing. They thought he was out of his mind. It made no sense to them. And why would it, right? The words and actions of a person in love rarely, if ever, make sense to those who haven't experienced it, to those who are just witnessing it. I mean, think about it. Even in the romantic love sort of situations, if you've never experienced that, if you're just witnessing it, it doesn't make any sense, right? How many of you have ever been compelled, right, being in love with somebody else to do something somebody else thought was crazy? Show of hands. It's okay. You can be bold. Okay. I know pretty much all of you. The rest of you, you're in church. Don't lie, okay? It's okay. <laughs> I mean, for the entire first year I was courting Lindsay, I had people questioning the things that I was saying and doing. They, but they hadn't experienced this love. They didn't know what I was experiencing, what, the ways that love was moving me, right? That's the thing about love. It moves you. 
How much more should the love of Christ move us? See, that's the picture Paul is trying to paint here when he says the love of Christ controls us. I know it doesn't really read that way for us, though. The translation's a little funky there because I think for us, right, we think of the love of Christ controlling us and we think of maybe like a puppet master, right, that it controls our every move. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He's actually pointing to something different. This Greek word he uses for love, or for control, sorry, it means to be pressed together, to be pressed together. So instead of that puppet master visual, what I want you to think of is this image of a hiker, a hiker in a very narrow passageway, right, where the walls are closing and pressing in on him from both sides, leaving him with no choice but to either go back to where he came from or to keep moving forward, following on the path that has been set before him. Paul says it's that type of pressure that Christ's love puts on us. Pressure that's meant to motivate us, to compel us, to move us, drive us forward. I love what one translation puts it. It says this, the love of Christ leaves us with no choice but to live our lives in response to it. The love of Christ leaves us with no choice but to live our lives in response to it. So let the world think what they want, friends. Because as Francis Chan puts in his book, Crazy Love, something is wrong if our lives make sense to unbelievers. Something is wrong if our lives make sense. The way we live should cause them to ask what's different, why we live the way that we live. But it shouldn't just change the way the world sees us, it should change the way that we see the world. Sorry, we see ourselves, I'm getting ahead of myself. Paul says the love of Christ has convinced him of this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. Okay. You read that sentence, and it's you kind of come to gloss over it. One has died for all, therefore all have died. Now, we gloss over it, I think, because of this. We see one has died for all, and we're like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. I know. Jesus died for all of us, right? His blood has redeemed all of us. We sing about it. We know this. But I want you to look at the second part of that sentence, right? Because our natural, I don't know, just disposition is to say, yeah, Jesus has died for all of us, and so we're all going to go live in heaven. We're all going to live this glorious life. But Paul doesn't say that. He says, one has died for all, therefore all have died. One has died for all, therefore all have died. What he's pointing out to us is that Christ didn't just die as your substitute. He died as your representative. He didn't just die instead of you. He died as you. Let me say that again. He didn't just die instead of you. He died as you. And so since Christ died in your place as your representative, this is what that means. It means that you now get to receive all of the benefits from what he did as though you yourself did it. That means his death on the cross put to death your old self, right? That you that you used to be died on the cross with Jesus so that the new life, the one that he created you for, could be lived, right? That you could receive the spirit of Christ and that he would live inside of you. I love the way that John MacArthur puts this. uh, He summarizes this in his commentary. He says it this way. All of our sins, our long list of crimes against God were legally charged to him on the cross as if he had lived it. So that Christ's righteous life could be credited to us as if we lived it. We're legally charged him on the cross as if he lived it so that Christ's righteous life could be credited to us as if he lived it. The love of Christ should change the way we see ourselves, family. Because our old selves no longer exist. They died with Jesus on the cross. And so what Paul is going to say as he goes on is, since Jesus died as our representative, now we must live as his Since Christ died as our representative, we must live as his. So we're going to get to that in just a minute. But before we do that, before we talk about what it means to be his representative, we have to talk about how the love of Christ changes not just the way that we see ourselves, but the way we see others. Look with me, if you would, at verses 16 and 17. It says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. See, what he's saying is that because of this love we've received from Jesus, there are no longer any more human distinctions. Nothing that, from a human perspective, we can use to separate us. Right? There's no black or white, no Democrat or Republican, no rich or poor. There's none of that. When we see others through the lens of the gospel, there's only those who have received it and those who have yet to hear it. So our primary concern shouldn't be about what others can do for us or about what we can do for them. It's do they know what Jesus has done for them? 
That's why our very first core value here at Awaken is that we make people feel at home. Because we want everybody walking through those doors to experience the unconditional love that we have received from Jesus. That way we know when they walk in those doors, they see Jesus. And when they sit in these seats, they hear Jesus. That way we know when they leave those doors, they haven't just heard about the love of Jesus. They have experienced that transformational love of Jesus. Man, if you are here this morning, maybe you haven't been to church in a while. Maybe you've never been to church. I want you to know. It doesn't matter how checkered your past is. It doesn't matter what you carried in here this morning. That the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus died as you in the same way he died as me. He died as your representative in the same way he died as my representative. It's not just good news, family. It's the best news ever. And it should change the way that each of us see those around us. But here's the reality, right? We have to break down some old habits. Right? We've got some, some worldly tendencies inside of ourselves to separate and to divide in our minds based off of some human perspectives. It's not our fault, really. I mean, we've been conditioned that way by our society. And even in healthy and vibrant church families like this one, it still happens. I'm just going to be real. It still happens. See, as we continue to grow in numbers, and by God's grace, we continue to grow in diversity, we have to continue to contend for this type of unity. Because the fact is that even in a healthy and vibrant church like ours, we can tend to glorify those that we agree with and gossip about those that we don't understand. Think about that in your own life. We glorify those we agree with, and we gossip about those that we don't understand. Or we draw close to those who are in the same stage of life while pushing away those who live in a little bit of a different fashion as we do. I'm telling you, we categorize people in more ways than we even understand, more ways than we realize. We pass judgments and we make decisions based off of human distinctions. But when we see others through the lens of the gospel, when we look at others through the love of Christ, it changes everything. It doesn't blind us to the reality of our differences. What it does is it binds us together in the truth that we are all sinners in desperate need of grace. So if you can understand that, family, if you can embrace that one simple truth, it will change the way that you see others. You will see every single life as a life worth saving. See, Paul reminds us in Romans 10, verses 12 and 13, he says, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. That's his way of saying there is no more distinctions based off of any human standards. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him for everyone Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It says everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. He's Lord of all. No matter who they love, where they've been, or what pain they may have caused you, the Bible tells us that if they call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Because just like me and you, they are children of God. That's not a political statement. That is a biblical truth. The same Lord is Lord of all, and everyone who calls on his name will be saved. And family, here's the great part. This is where you and I come in. And that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That should shift our perspective then outwards. Because if we believe in this truth, then we must be forced to wrestle with this next question that Paul is going to ask. In Romans 10, right after that, he goes on to say, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Listen, family, God, by his grace, has adopted you as his son and as his daughter. He has redeemed you by the blood of Jesus. He's transformed your heart. And now by his divine plan, even though he could have chosen any other method by which to bring salvation to his people, he has chosen you as his representative. I don't know why, but that's the truth. He has chosen you to be his messenger, to go out, to represent the one who represented you on the cross so that the world might know the hope and love of Jesus. Man, if this doesn't fire you up, I don't know what will, honestly. This is why we are called to be his ambassadors, because the love of Christ should change the way that we live. Look with me at verses 18 through 21. Paul says this, all this is from God 
who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what Paul does, he says, all of these things, all of these things we've been talking about, they are all true of you, not because of anything you've done, but because God reconciled you to himself through Jesus. This concept of reconciliation It's this idea of restoring a relationship, of bringing peace and harmony where there was once division and conflict. And family, this is not only what God has done for you through Jesus, it's what God wants to do through you for others. You see that? It's not only what God has done for you through Jesus, it's what God wants to do through you for others. That's why Paul declares that we are ambassadors for Christ. We've been sent into our environments with a purpose And it's absolutely crucial that we understand what this purpose is, what it means, what it's going to take. So I want to spend the rest of our time here this morning actually laying that out for you, what it means for us to be all in ambassadors for Christ. So I want to start first by talking about just what it means to be an ambassador, right? Because Paul uses this illustration. It's one that both Jew and Gentile would have known. And actually, 2,000 years later, the role really hasn't changed a whole lot. And so we should all have a basic understanding of what an ambassador is. An ambassador is someone who is sent to deliver a message, right? They're sent as a representative of a a king or of a country to deliver a message to a foreign land, right? And that message most often is to declare or to establish peace. They carry the message of reconciliation. You guys seeing the connection there? And so our role as spiritual ambassadors, as ambassadors for Christ, is to live in this world that's in rebellion to God and to be sent into that world, right, onto foreign soil, if you will, carrying this message of reconciliation with the goal of bringing peace and harmony where there was once conflict and division. Are y'all tracking with me? Good. See, Paul is making this connection so that those hearing these words would understand that the same things that are true of an ambassador, like a diplomatic ambassador, are true of us as spiritual ambassadors, as ambassadors for Christ. So let's talk about what it means to be an ambassador got three truths here for you real quick. The first is that it means we are no longer living for ourselves. Just like Paul says in verse 15, this life we live, we no longer live for ourselves. We live for others under the direction of the one who sent us. Number two, it means we no longer speak on our own authority, but we speak with the authority of the one who sent us, just like any ambassador would. In case you're wondering about that authority, let me fix your eyes on Matthew 28. Right after Jesus sends his disciples out, he says, it's all authority has been given on heaven and on earth. He says, it's been given to me. So when we share the good news of the gospel, we take that message of reconciliation onto foreign soil. It's on his authority that we speak. Being an ambassador for Christ, it means we no longer live for ourselves. We no longer speak on our authority. And it means that we are never alone. See, the one that's sending us provides us with everything we need, and he stands ready to protect us in the same way our government does for our ambassadors. Again, remember the, Jesus, the final words Jesus speaks at the Great Commission when he sends out his disciples. What does he say? Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is what it means for us to be ambassadors for Christ. Now that you know what it means, let's talk about what it's going to take, what's required of you as ambassadors. Three more truths to share as I wrap this message up. The first truth is obvious, right? In order to be an ambassador for Christ, we must be fully engaged with him. You guys know that's part of our mission statement. We call people to live fully engaged lives with Jesus, with each other, and with our world. After all, how can you speak for someone if you never talk to them? You guys see that? Our ambassadors here in this country who are serving overseas, they have to be constantly connected with our leadership. In the same way that we must be constantly connected to Jesus. This is why time in prayer, time in the word is so important. That's why time spent in this community is important because we're not meant to do this alone either. And as I was thinking about these two truths this week, I thought about this old, uh, this this, this example that I was given a little while back. 
how the, some of the earliest African converts to Christianity, how committed they were in their private devotional time. See, each of them would have their own spot sort of out in the brush, out in the thicket where they would go and they would pour their hearts out to God. And since they went so often, that path towards their sacred space, it was well-worn. And so you'd see from a, a village that there would be several paths out into the brush. But over time, if one were to maybe fall away from their personal devotional time, what would happen is some, some grass would grow on that path allowing the neighbors to give them a gentle nudge, say, hey, brother, there is grass growing on your path. I wonder for some of you this morning if there is some grass growing on your path. And if that's you, I want you to know that there's, there's grace for you today. But this is also why we exist as a church, right? To call each other to live fully engaged lives with Jesus, to make sure that path is well-worn, and that it speaks to the transformation that is happening both in your heart and the hearts of those around you. So being an ambassador for Christ, it requires us to be fully engaged with him. It also requires us to be fully focused on his mission. That's the second truth, to be fully focused on his mission. In case you're confused about what this mission is, let me point you back to Matthew 28, where Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is the mission each of us has been given as ambassadors for Christ. It's the mission he's given us even as a church to go, to disciple, to baptize, and to teach. Now all we have to do is stay fully focused on it. Pretty simple, right? Wrong. <laughs> it's not that simple, right? This world is full of distractions. Even as a church, it can be tempting for us to get distracted by programs or events that feel like they might be the right thing to do, but are ultimately drawing us away from the mission that God has commissioned us to do. Even for you as parents or as employees, it can be tempting to get distracted by the promotion, by the college fund, by the youth sports, these things that feel like the things that we should have or do, these things that the world tells us that we should have or do, but in actuality are really just drawing us away from the thing that God has called us to do. It's so easy to get distracted, to lose sight of the mission that God has given us. But we need to start to realize that the good things that God has given us in this life can sometimes be the very things that distract us from the God thing that he has created us to do. There's a discernment that has to happen there. I'm not telling you to go sell all your stuff. Maybe God is, I'm not. <laughs> You know what I mean? We have to be able to discern these things, not just to chase after the things that the world wants us to do. But does this fit into the mission that God has given me for my life? Does this tell the story of Jesus and of his love to those that are around me? This is a question we must constantly wrestle with, especially in this environment we live in. It's why we've made the decision as a church to remove even the best distractions so that we might be able to more fully focus on the mission that God has given us. So let me ask you, church, when you look at your own life, when you look at yourself this morning, are you fully focused on the mission? As an ambassador for Christ, are you fully focused on the mission that he has laid out for you? It's not a trick question, right? It's laid out in Matthew 28. Is there room in your life to go? Are you creating space for discipleship? Are you engaging in community? Are you seeking out other opportunities to, to reach people with the gospel? Being an ambassador for Christ, family, requires us to be fully engaged with him, it requires us to be fully focused on his mission. And lastly, as I invite the band back up, it requires us being fully committed to the cost. Fully committed to the cost. Because being an ambassador, it's not a part-time commitment. I actually learned this week as I was uh, diving a little bit deeper into what it takes to be an ambassador for our country, become a U.S. ambassador. And I was actually a little bit surprised to learn that this was a, a lifelong sort of commitment. It requires decades spent learning new languages, volunteering of time, sacrificing financially, serving the needy, and of course being willing to go wherever called. If that sounds familiar to you, it's because it parallels the commitment that we make as ambassadors for Christ. But there's one big difference. See, as ambassadors for a country, those are roles that you have to earn. 
but you've already been appointed. You've already been given this role. Whether you've been following Jesus for one day or your entire life, you are an ambassador for Christ. The only question is, are you willing to make that sacrifice? Are you willing to go? Are you willing to give? Are you willing to serve? Are you willing to lay your life down for the sake of the gospel? That's the ultimate reality. Is that as ambassadors for Christ, serving him may cost us everything. But in the end, I can guarantee you it's going to be worth it. Because nothing compares to the love of Jesus. We are called to be fully engaged, fully focused, fully committed. So family, the next time the world tempts you by those things that can offer you a distraction or the comfort or the security that you need, I want you to remember your identity, that you are an ambassador for Christ. And I want you to turn to him in that moment to be reminded that nothing will ever compare to the love which you have received from him. It's just like the old hymn encourages us to turn your eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world, they will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace.